So what do you think are some of the challenges that the Madani government is going to face? Because TMJ already said that when SOJ takes over, he's going to have a hard time. All right, welcome back to our second episode with Dr. Ong Kian Ming here. If those of you guys who enjoy this show so far and you like this and you think that this should be made into a regular season, we need to give it a name, right? Yeah. Comments below. Comments below, right? Suggestion OKM for names. And suggestion for name as well, right? Yes. yes. Now, last week. Wait, wait, wait oh, before we go on, uh, is Zeus Coffee our spon- is this sponsor of the show? <laughs> I, I just so happen to like their okay. coffee. So every time I happen to buy it, but they are not the sponsor of the show. But, but they could be, la, they could be. Let's they could say, be, they could this, be. Yeah. This, this could be made into a different, uh, a separate show, you know? So Zeus, Zeus, know, give you maybe you wanna uh, uh, consider at least give us some free cups of coffee because every time we do a show we buy at least a few cups of coffee. Dude. And I need <laughs> coffee to to stay awake during the day. So I, and I like happen to like your your, your brand as well. So <laughs> last week we talked about the change of lineup. Not last week, but uh, uh, just the last, last episode. episode. Yes. Yeah, we yes. talked about change of lineup, yeah. and uh, we Cabinet, definitely did yeah. get some comments from the public on this, right? Yeah. Now, so I'm gonna read out some of the comments, but the first one that I want to talk about is uh, I think this is a very meaningful one. Uh, this person said, "I always enjoy listening to uh, Doctor Ong and Peter regarding digital ID, yeah, mm. uh, which we're gonna touch about it a lot more later." Mm. And the person actually did say this. I think. I like this kind of interview because it tells us as taxpayer what are we paying for? <laughs> mm, the pensions and also the, the responsibility. <laughs> yes, stuff, yeah. yeah. And they say that uh, we need this kind of quality people like Ken Ming as MP. So that's a praise to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that kind of wisdom can be shared if let's say we continue this show. Yeah. I have to say that one of the main reasons that I actually uh, talk to more politicians especially after having the access with this show and uh, do enjoy speaking to you more often as well. Is the fact that I agree with him. As a taxpayer, I feel I know at least what's happening to my nation and the tax money that is going. Mm. Uh, whether is it worth it, whether is it not. Uh, although I can't do anything, but at least I know. Lah. No, you can do something. You're, you're having this show, you're hosting this show. You're letting people get more access to information and then you can let them judge for themselves. That's right. Yeah, that's because I don't dare join politics. So the only thing that I can do is... Uh, helping Malaysians to be much more aware of, you know, the decisions that you're going to make in politics, right? Sure. Yeah, and you can contribute to the nation regardless of whether in politics or not. Yeah. That, that's what I always believe. We will have a separate show where we can talk about different ways of contributing to the larger... Uh, policy and political space without necessarily being part of politics. That sounds great. Yeah, we should do that. Let me run through a second comment here, right? Malaysia is a very small country with 33 million population. Mm. We already have one of the highest number of MP per capita. Mm. So we have a very fat government budget. Mm. Now, add more minister. Mm. What's the need for that? Uh, I would say that that person is right in the sense that uh, we have uh, by per capita basis a lot more ministers than let's say India for example or, or Singapore. Uh, I would say that if let's say the ministers are able to show that they can deliver value including economic value, I think they can more than enough uh, pay for the salary. So for example, if we have a good tourism promotion policy that brings in billions and billions of ringgits for our tourism sector and also all the ancillary services that are around tourism, I would I will happily pay for 10 more tourism uh, ministers. La, right? So, uh, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen whether or not the ministers, the ministries can show that kind of uh, value added. And, and for some ministries, it may not be in the form of economic value added. It may be in the form of, for example, the women's ministry. How you go out and to help the people in the, in the deprived uh, areas and also in, among the B40 community that is able to uplift them so that they don't have to depend uh, on government aid. And then you can also save some money at the same mm. time. So um, I, I know where the commentator is uh, coming from, but I think it's incumbent on the people in government, uh, even people in opposition backbenchers, to show that they are contributing value to uh, the role that they, are, they, that they have. Yeah, actually, I, I, I do agree with what you say as well, right? Uh, as long as the person is performing. Uh, but as a, as a right guard, here's the question, right? I, I, I don't even know what's the KPI for every single ministry. Yeah. Is there a way to actually download and do they actually... No, there's no KPI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there used to be when uh, Idris <laughs> Jala was the... Was there the should be, what, like, like yeah. you should at least tell like my ministry is doing what and then this uh, the money that's given to me is allocated to what purpose and what kind of outcome I... I should expect. Yeah, so like, one way to address this would be if let's say uh, a ministry 
were to make it mandatory, I mean, PM were to make it mandatory for each ministry to publish uh, some sort of report card at the end of the year. Mm. I'm, I'm quite glad that, uh, you know, METI, every year uh, we publish an annual report, uh, mm. you know, which documents, uh, you know, my old ministry. Uh, METI, you know, would, would document what has been done from a policy, from an investment, from a trade perspective, you know. So, although not many people read it, but I think it's still good for stock taking and also for for record and reference. Yeah. So let's say every ministry could do that. I think it will be good and make it a little bit more, more public, make it a little bit more attached to the uh, performance of the minister. I think it will be something mm. that would uh, be quite good to do. So if anyone from the PMO is uh, listening, maybe there's something that you can suggest yeah. to PMX. La. That's right. I, I recall last time when I interviewed Tengku Zafro as well, he did mention that during his term as a uh, finance minister, he actually kind of launched something like a report card yeah, every six Laksana, months, right? You know, Laksana yeah. report card. And then you know, yeah. it, would, it would tell like when the money is being allocated, what is the outcome of that in every six months? Uh, yeah. No, I, actually we can even go further. I mean, I've shared this on BFM before. Uh, you know, some when we were in opposition last time, when I was in, uh, you know, in uh, still in parliament, uh, some of my colleagues would ask for, oh, how much did this minister spend when they go overseas, <laughs> right? And then they will say, oh, how can you juicy, spend so much? Juicy, blah, blah, yeah? blah. No, but but to me, actually, the amount is not so important. Of course, you know, it should be within certain spending mm. limits, lah. It cannot be too overboard. But what is more important is actually. What did the minister accomplish when he or she went overseas? Mm. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure whether you know this, but every time a minister or deputy minister goes out for an overseas trip, uh, an officer has to write a summary of the report, uh, like a report of what was done, who this person met, uh, you know, uh, what was the outcome, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Right? So if let's say, you know, we could have that kind of practice, even starting from, uh, uh, you know, trips overseas of course you want to redact something or leave things out which are more sensitive you know some people that you meet uh, may not may have not have not have to appear you know but at least some of the some of the sort of like uh, agenda items yeah. and discussion items which uh, again I'm quite glad that MITI actually publishes this information uh, whenever the minister goes abroad, abroad for a investment trade mission uh, the ministry usually publish a statement to say what, what was done who the minister met what kind of uh, uh, investments were discussed and maybe some some uh, dollar amount as well. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think this is something that uh, has been a continuity thing that has been doing in MITI, uh, which you can see as uh, Tengku Zafu taken over, you know, doing that as well. Yes. And even when he's there, he will do Instagram telling people like, hey, yeah, today yeah. I meet who? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, 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 I thought it's good. I it, it, makes me feel like, yeah. it makes me feel like it's worth seeing them bringing one kampong pergi. Yeah. Like, like, okay lah, fine lah, you're doing work, you know, that kind of feeling, right? Yeah, and actually yeah. MITI is one of the smallest budgets in the whole of government. Ooh, wow. Yeah. wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, for, for, you know, I, I think MITI definitely punches above its weight lah in, uh, in the international mm. setting. Anyways, okay. yep. Yeah, uh, any, any Last uh, question here, right? Uh, wouldn't it be ineffective, right, uh, and bad for a country when we reshuffle it after one year? Uh, I mean, cabinet lah. Right. One can make an argument uh, that 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 is the case. That may be the case. Uh, that maybe you should give, let's say, two years. Uh, you will have a better idea of uh, who the ministers who are performing and not performing are. Uh, but but I think uh, there were reasons, good reasons for there to be additions to the cabinet. MK two second finance minister position, for example, federal territories, uh, and then also filling up the the seat that was left by the late Saluddin Ayub in uh, domestic trade. And then at the same time, I think very practical if let's say this minister is not performing after one year you want to give the minister another year you'll still be not performing <laughs> right so if that's you know that that's the case why not just uh, do the changes uh, you know sooner rather than later that's true that's right true. so I mean you, you're not talking about like three months then you change one year I think is sufficient time right I mean let's say you're working in a corporate sector if your performance is really crap after one year the HR people and your bosses will yeah, know yeah. you're crap yeah, right I would <laughs> yeah, I would just switch, man. Like, yeah. what's the point, man? Wasting time. Yeah, yeah someone this one is going to affect our lives, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so of, of course, I think some people will say not enough changes were made, lah, you know? Uh, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a separate discussion. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Mm. You guys can leave your comment down below. Now, nonetheless, let's go into the topic for today, right? Today, we're going to be talking about the revival of Johor economy. Yeah? Yes, the special economic zone uh, that was announced uh, between Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, and also f- f- focusing very much on uh, the Johor Singapore ecosystem. This was, uh, you know, something that uh, was uh, follow on uh, after the discussions between Johor and Malaysia on the Iskandar Corridor side. Mm. So in Johor, that started, you know, between 
uh, Rafizi uh, as the Minister for Economy and also On Hafiz as the MB for Johor, talking with uh, the Minister for National Development, uh, Desmond Lee, and also the Acting Transport Minister, Chi Hong Tat. Uh, so, but that was only for discussion with regards to the Iskandar corridor, right? The, the you know, then this was escalated uh, at a higher level uh, to be part and parcel of the ministerial dialogue. MTI uh, on Singapore side, MITI, um, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and then on Malaysia side, Rafizi's uh, Ministry, yeah. uh, Ministry of Economy, uh, to be able to put some ideas on the table as to what the MOU uh, would entail with regards to some of the ideas like and and uh, you know i shared an article with you where i actually gave 10 proposals yes. uh, on how to put more beef and more meat into this uh, mou with regards to to ideas like. so before we go into the details right of yeah. all these uh, i think it's it's uh, for most of the public when we talk about johor uh, yeah. we all remember at one point in time iskandar johor was like whoa sure. the rara hype right yep. and then after that it became a very quiet thing mm. uh, and then we have a lot of questions like for example uh, for City people yep. were asking like what happened to it sure. right uh, and then uh, Iskandar development what happened to it because yep. at one point it was so big that even we had a we had a studio there Pine yeah, yeah, Studio yeah. I still remember which has been sold right yeah. which has been sold uh, yeah. and then uh, things only started catching on again lately yeah. uh, with the SEZ yeah and mm. with the anticipation of SOJ who's going to become the Agong, our, yep. Agong. Mm. yeah so maybe it's good to give a background a little bit of this whole, how did this Iskanda corridor okay. thing started developing and what's the background? Yeah, so that was during part last time uh, and uh, these four different corridors, including the Northern Corridor, Eastern Corridor. Uh, hey, maybe firstly, what's a corridor? Yeah, <laughs> corridor, I, I think basically means uh, some sort of a special economic zone within a country uh, where there are certain entities that were established by acts of parliament uh, where they would have certain budget to do investment promotion and things of that nature. Like free trade, like, like yeah, tax I, I, free, yeah, that kind no, of stuff, right? Yeah, no, tax incentives. Lah. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's quite a lot of overlap actually with what Maida does. And uh, the Prime Minister has also announced that uh, in the National Committee on Investment um, uh, meeting sometime this year, that Maida would consolidate a lot of these investment promotion activities from the corridors. Uh, including in is Iskandar. Mm. So that's something that I'm aware of since I'm a board member of Maida. But going back to Iskandar, I think I actually think that Iskandar from a from a planning standpoint has had quite a lot of uh, interesting selling points. And that uh, you know the Iskandar Regional Development Authority uh, they got a lot of ideas from as a result of the the investment of time and resources by Kazana. Right because Kazana is uh, one yeah. of the largest landowners there. Uh, this was land that was inherited from uh, UEM. A lot of it was um, palm oil that was converted into uh, residential, commercial, uh, industrial development. So from a master planning standpoint, uh, Irda actually quite well thought out. So for example, I don't know whether you remember, uh, there's uh, Education City. Yes. Right. So there's University of Reading, uh, Southampton, uh, uh, Mar Maritime University from Netherlands and whatnot. Right, so that is supposed to sort of like build up the education ecosystem. Uh, they yeah, they're still there. They're still they're there. Still there? Yeah. Uh, some doing better than others. I haven't right. been there in a while. So, uh, you know, I, I think that ecosystem can be enhanced, especially if, let's say, we get more foreign students to come to Malaysia. Mm. Uh, but that's that's a separate story. So, the, the that's the education uh, part. There's also the entertainment part. Mm. Legoland, uh, Hello Kitty, which yes. has closed down since. That's right? right. I think Legoland is still surviving, but barely so. Uh, and then you have the... Health part of fun, right? part of the entertainment would include um would include uh this uh, Pine Studios yes. Pine Studios that has been sold yes. to uh, uh entity in Singapore but uh you know uh, they are capital actually from uh, originally from China yeah so yeah and then there's there's the the health hub the right? health hub um not much going on there there's supposed to be some sort of a services hub as well Frost and Sullivan moved there put in their sort of like a Malaysian and regional HQ. Uh, but I think they have had a problem maintaining staff there mm. because the ecosystem is not very uh, well developed. So, you know, and then of, of course, there's the property play. Yeah. Like, but, uh, the you famous know. forest city. Uh, Actually, no, no. it's so beautiful, eh? Yeah, okay, I mean, so, the architecture uh, is so beautiful. So I would say that there were property players involved in the Irda ecosystem even before Forest City. Mm. You're talking about people like Sunway, uh, you know, SP Satya, all the major developers in, uh, in Malaysia. 
uh, they are there in Iskanda, but not in, in Forest City. La. So Forest City was a later addition. Uh, and I think definitely would have had some effect uh, on the property ecosystem, created certain maybe questions that investors from Singapore and other places were, were, were asking. And it's not just Forest City. There were other big uh, developments from uh, Chinese developers in other parts of uh, Johor Bahru as well. Mm. Uh, so I think this is part and parcel of the, the challenge that I think uh, Sultan of Johor has also expressed uh, interest in trying to to resolve. La. Have you been to Forest City before? I haven't been in Forest City, okay. uh, but I was at Iskanda in the early days of the development. What yeah. was your impression then? Well, I thought it was like really beautiful. Uh. It was the... You go to Putri Harbour, that side? Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's and a nice I visited uh, around the Legoland Park, yes. you know, I'll go and see properties, yeah. uh, see how they actually were like uh, refilling the land so that they can build out further some more. Uh, but there was always this lingering question, right, of um, will it really succeed? Because when we were looking at the development during the time, you're talking about really, really big scale. Yep. Uh, I recall it was about 300 over a billion. Mm. That that's, that was the aim, right? Uh, although by funding basis, it, it did achieve quite like trend over. Some, yeah, yeah. yeah. But some not, not fully. Yeah. But the question is that the real activities that's going on, yeah. it, it felt like there was no continuity. It kind of like mm. after they finished selling all the property, mm. then what's next? Mm. Then definitely because of that, there was this whole question that TMJ after they came out and say, sure. hey, it is because of the central, uh, the federal government did not continue mm. by pushing forward sure. with this uh, development or corridor. Yeah. Let's leave the discussion of Forest City uh, towards the end of uh, you know the SEZ discussion first. Yep. Let's talk about I think the the ideas that we can sort of like uh, think about with regards to developing um, the economic ecosystem in Johor, especially southern Johor, together with Singapore. Mm. Right. So some people have said, oh, uh, this is uh, Malaysia's Shenzhen story, Shenzhen. Yep. Uh, whereby you know you latch on to Shenzhen latched on to to Hong Kong. Hong Kong, like we uh, latch on to Singapore. Lah. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that can be part of the narr narrative. And I think uh, to make that happen, we need to have a few elements, which is what I, you know, the article or the 10 proposals that I wrote. So one of the first things, I think we need to improve physical connectivity to Singapore. Mm. We have the RTS, uh, the sort of like rail system, the MRT system that will connect Johor Bahru with the Singapore MRT system. Yep. That will come in play around end of 2026 if there's no major delays. Uh, and that will actually be a game changer in terms of in enhancing connectivity. La. But I think there are other things that we can do as well. So, uh, you know, this I give credit to Liu Chintong. A lot of uh, good ideas coming from him. Uh, and he's also the MP yeah, for his Kanda MP for Putri. Iskandar, right? <laughs> so he's actually proposed, uh, you know, why not uh, have a ferry connection, uh, you know, in uh, between, let's say, either Forest City or Putri Harbour, connecting to Tuas. Yes. There's a Raffles Marina there. I recall during the time when I visited many years yeah. back, mm. it was already part of like the thing that they kind of like talked about, floating yes. the idea already. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, that depends on the appetite for Singapore to uh, start the, the conversations uh, with Malaysia on the transport side and then on the, uh, the, the, the home affairs side because of security immigration. But I think that could be one connectivity. Mm. Uh, the other area that, uh, that has been discussed before in the past that Chintong uh, brought to my attention is going from Pasir Gudang to Changi. Mm. So Pasir Gudang is where a lot of uh, you know, industrial activity and also a lot of uh, people live in Pasir Gudang and actually work in Singapore. Mm. This would be uh, you know, more from the B40 population, uh, a lot of... Uh, um, uh, Malay workers there and also people from East Malaysia working in the factories and the service, and the service uh, sector in Singapore. If you can connect it by ferry to Changi, that also can be a win-win situation for Singapore as well because the Changi sort of like terminal at the southern, southeastern tip, there's no big development plans there yet. Right? So if let's say you know, we can have a development agenda in Pasir Gudang uh, that entails some sort of a ferry terminal that is enhanced uh, and then connecting to, to, to Changi side. I think that would be a win-win situation for, for both uh, people. And then just one more. This is an idea that uh, was floated to me by somebody in the corporate sector. La. Why not, in addition to the RTS, why not build a cable car mm. that you can use around the, the original causeway area, uh, connecting properties around that area that there are some property and also empty land that can be used, connecting to the Woodlands uh, Exchange. Yeah, because it's actually not that far. And also it can be a tourist attraction. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I got this idea from uh, some of the developments that I was made aware of in, uh, of all places, Colombia, where they use cable car connectivity as a way to do urban renewal. Mm -hmm. And I actually suggested this to Lim Guan Ning when he was the chief minister of uh, Penang to say, why not consider some sort of cable car system from... Uh, 
uh, the shortest point from the island to the mainland, right? And then uh, rather than building a tunnel, you have a cable car, and this can be also part and parcel of your your the tourist attraction as right, well. Right, right. Yeah, another thing, right? Is there? Do you think there's a need to actually build another road? Yes. Uh, this was also one of my suggestions. Uh, you know, uh, having more connectivity is uh, better than less. Uh, this could be in the form of uh, a third link. Yeah, because uh, two also so jam. Yes, correct. Yeah. So <laughs> third link, I think that will really en- enhance physical connectivity. Uh, and, you know, of course, there's also discussion of the high-speed rail. I think we should take that towards the end when we talk about uh, Forest City and also some of the policies that the Sultan of Johor have, uh, have expressed, uh, you know, in a recent interview with Straits Times. So the physical connectivity is important. And I think the second proposal I made was to improve the digital connectivity. Mm. What do I mean by that? Uh, so, you know, Singapore has this SingPass thing that I talked about in yes. the last interview. Malaysia is trying to develop our own digital ID. You know, it would be amazing if, let's say, we could have interoperability right from the start in terms of the, the Malaysian design of that digital ID. Uh, and we could have uh, passport-free travel, but using the, the digital uh, ID app to go through immigration from Malaysia to Singapore. Just scan it and then you're through. So at, at this point, maybe it's good that I bring up this one particular comment by one of our uh, audience, right? Mm. They, he said this, regarding the digital ID, if you have a Singaporean friend, ask politely to see their sing pass and you will be impressed. Literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. show, yes, show us I haven't seen before, yeah. right? And everything is in there. Their health record, their financial record, their yeah. retirement record. CPF and... Everything uh, yeah. is in there. Uh, you know, right? when you, when you, passport, when you get your when you get your NS call up, you know, that's that's uh, in your sing pass as well. Or yeah. you can access it use, use using your sing pass. Yeah. Uh, for example, if let's say your driver's license, the, you know, now we have a digital version. Uh, if it's going to be expired, you get a notification from the Sing Pass as well. So I think uh, we need to have a better uh, sort of like uh, understanding of the ecosystem and to see how we can learn from them and also probably learn from some of the mistakes they made when they were developing some of the software ecosystem mm. on uh, the digital ID. Because one of the things that, that, that made it very slow for us to travel in between, so, so the the process of going down. Yes. Yeah, that kind Correct. of Correct, yeah, right? immigration. And then sometimes you have shortage of immigration officers and stuff That's like right. that. Like so if you have the digital ID where you can literally just scan it and then go across, mm. I think that would be a game changer. Yeah, the other day was at Changi Airport. Like, literally, it's like... Yeah, just scan, just you know, your face, and you know, put just in your passport. Past. And, everything and just walk past. Yeah. Like, I was just thinking to myself, right? If you can actually have the exact same thing, like like uh, maybe a toll booth kind of style, right? I just yeah. scan, put my thing there, get it... Uh, get it verified that I just cross the border just like that I think that would at least maybe if you do a study it can like ease the traffic by maybe 10-20% or something maybe even more yeah maybe, maybe even, even more, more yeah, right? and yeah. imagine if let's say you have that replicated across three crossings yeah then suddenly you know uh, people in Singapore would not uh, be thinking ah I don't want to go over to Johor this uh, this weekend because it's too jam it's holiday you know it's like oh you know it's just like driving from yeah. uh Orchard Road to, to Woodlands or something That's like right. that. You know, it's very, That's very right. easy. Yeah, and very encouraging more spending here as well. We, yes, yes. We yeah, will be very happy. Yeah. We also will be very happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then you know, the more businesses may, may locate to Johor as well and to, to build the Johor economy. That's right. What, what are some yeah. other things that you so suggested? The, the, the third thing that I talked about was uh, to improve uh, uh, you know, connectivity and also uh, investment and business activity in uh, digital economy. So one particular example I gave was... Uh, you know, using Joho as, you know, you, you have this concept called, uh, you know, uh, software as a service, right? Yes. As, SAAS, you know, where you offer these services on the cloud and whatnot. Why not use Joho or Joho Baru as a sandbox as a service? Meaning, whatever stuff that you develop in Singapore, for example, um, you know, you want to find ways of deploying it, right? Uh, deploying it, meaning, let's say you have certain apps or you have uh, certain software applications, uh, or phone applications that need a more diverse population to to deploy. Uh, you know, let's say from a language perspective, uh, you want uh, Mandarin uh, language deployment. Uh, you want even uh, foreign uh, BM. Uh, you know, BM deployment, which is something that you can do in Malaysia as well as Singapore uh, as Indonesia. And then you have maybe things that you want to deploy from a service perspective to the foreign worker population. Mm. Right. So then you want to use not just uh, Joho as a sandbox to test, but you want to know, okay, this app, when it goes from Joho to Singapore, what are the things that you need to change to enhance? Right. Uh, Grab has done it pretty well. You know, when I go from one country to another, the, 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 the transition is seamless. Yeah. Right? Are there any other applications that, that you can do? Uh, you know, let's say uh, merchant trade, for example, uh, you know, to do uh, payment uh, processing among the uh, immigrant uh, community, migrant community, and also the, the foreign workers. 
uh, that you know you'll be able to uh, allow them to uh, you know do these kinds of transfers whether in Singapore or Malaysia right so there's a lot of these kinds of uh, uh, applications that would be able to help be helpful to grow the entrepreneur ecosystem in Johor as well mm. because you think about it right let's say the equivalent of um, uh, all the startups uh, that we see in the Klang Valley uh, you know and also the the PE and also the VC ecosystem uh, there's no such ecosystem in Johor because yeah. all the talent has gone to Singapore I agree, I agree. So this is one way in which you can bring the talent and also some of the activities back into Johor. So for example, uh, I have an edutech uh, kind of uh, application that I want to test. Uh, I have a health tech application that I want to test. Not only do I want to test it in Singapore, but I want to perhaps test it in uh, Johor as well. And I may want to bring in other tech players from around Southeast Asia who are uh, you know, uh, occupying the software uh, space uh, they want to invest in S Singapore as a start, but then sometimes cost can be quite expensive. So, okay, do customer acquisition in, in, in Johor. There is a fraction of the cost and also you're paying in ringgit. That's right. A actually, it's not just that. No, I think, I think to a certain extent, the, the uniqueness of... They, yep. they, they, their first thing is that whatever I build has to be global and for them to straight away test it out there's an easy place for them to straight away test it out in Malaysia I think it's a very inviting idea for many of the local businesses there and more importantly is that it also encourages skill transfer yep. it encourages employability in, in Malaysia and also it will help Malaysians who kind of want to work for Singapore company yep. don't have to go to Singapore exactly but can that. remain yeah. staying in Malaysia and therefore retaining the wealth within Malaysia and, and work out something. La. I think it's good for Malaysia economy. So I'll give you a, a couple of other examples. You know, um, Agri-Tech. Singapore is yeah. spending a lot of money there, uh, including building vert vertical farms and uh, other uh, sort of like uh, food security uh, investments. Why not try to deploy some of them in Malaysia in Johor? That's right. Right, and and this was uh, you know um, you know something that that I talked thought about after different consultations with different people. We have a lot of uh, actually very good, uh, you know, farms uh, that double, uh, you know, that, that are sort of like producing organic produce and other produce vegetables and whatnot that are selling into the Singapore ecosystem. Uh, you know, why not use these people as people that you can do JVs with? Because they also have access to land. And then you deploy agri-tech, whether it's sort of like using drone technology to map out, uh, you know, fertility, you know, IoT devices to go and see how you can enhance the fertility of soil in, in different parts of Singapore and then uh, in different parts of Johor. And then this is actually not just a Singapore and Johor play. When you deploy successfully in Johor, then you could actually invest the same kind of technology in other parts of Southeast Asia. Yeah. So you can bring in agri-tech players uh, to invest uh, you know, in Johor using capital from primarily from Singapore first. That's right. Yeah, and then you can, you can try and deploy in Malaysia. The other areas uh, where Malaysia has an advantage is in halal products. Right? Imagine if, let's say, you develop some sort of a halal... Uh, certification uh, uh, product that needs to have access into the, the halal market is not so suitable for you to deploy in Singapore. That's Come right. to Malaysia. Uh, it can be a halal uh, sort of like version of uh, uh, you know Islamic finance, for example. Why not deploy it in, in Johor or other parts of Malaysia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So this is something that I think some people are already doing, but we need to put it together in a package so that Johor can really be highlighted as a very attractive option right. to be paired together with Singapore. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the thing is that we... The one thing, this reminds me of what uh, Chin Tong actually mentioned the last time, right? He said that uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that the talents in Malaysia and Singapore are actually one. Mm. You, it's actually one workforce in that sense. You, you can't see it as two separate workforce because people just migrate over, lah, right? And I think to a certain extent, like in this argument-wise, it makes a lot of sense because the sooner you acknowledge it, the sooner you can, you can milk that synergy instead. Because it's still fighting. And, and also, Maslow I think... Maslow just make the synergy. And, and Chintong is right in the sense that when you talk about this one workforce thing, right, I will push it even further. Because for, for Chintong, it's about trying to retain some of the Johor talent uh, to remain in Johor. I would say, if let's say we can create this kind of healthy ecosystem, right, Singapore entrepreneurs will relocate to Johor. Yes, yeah. it's kind of like EU like that. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that was one of the beauty of EU at the point, right? It's kind of like you can just cross, you can just build whatever business you want at any point. At, at anywhere and that kind of led to a lot of skill transfer and economic development in exactly. all the countries around it yeah. yeah so then it leads to my fourth point 
you know, we talked about physical connectivity, digital connectivity, and also the digital economy ecosystem. Uh, the, 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 the fourth uh, point that I brought up is actually with regards to cooperation on smart cities, right? When you talk about smart cities, right, Singapore has some of the, the, the ecosystem and infrastructure there already. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, things like uh, CCTV monitoring, uh, things like uh, ERP systems, electronic road pricing systems, uh, things like... Um, uh, you know, your your smart parking apps and things like that. You know, why not deploy that into Joho as well as part and parcel of the SCZ cooperation? Mm. So to, just to give an example, in Joho Baru, Joho Baru there are, uh, in, in the greater Joho Baru area, la, there are three municipalities, Pasir Gudang, JB, which is the old Joho Baru site, and then also Iskandar Putri. Yes. They all have different parking systems. Uh -huh. Right? Whereas in Selangor, we already have the smart Selangor app. It's not the best app. Yes. But it's already consolidated. Yes. Uh, and the Smart Selangor app, you can actually use it for parts of KL as well, where they have that uh, that that uh, smart parking. Yes. So Singapore already has that. Uh, it was developed smart. The the the, the parking dot SG uh, ecosystem was developed by Open Government Products, which is an arm of GovTech Singapore. Uh, Malaysia has a GovTech in. Uh, you know, uh, that has recently been established this year. Uh, so, you know, that can easily be part and parcel of the Smart Cities Corporation, you know, to, to introduce these kinds of innovations where, you know, Malaysia keep talking about smart cities, right? Mm. Have, have you actually seen very concrete examples of deployment of smart cities? I think they can't even describe what is a smart city problem. <laughs> no, la, God, la, God, la. we can, la, we can. But it's just a, <laughs> just a matter of actually being able to implement it in, in good use cases. La. So I think Slango has done a decent job, can yeah. do better. Uh, more things that can be uh, done, you know, even things like, for example, uh, do things like traffic warning, being able to access uh, traffic cameras real time to know where's the jam and, and yeah. stuff like that. So this part and parcel of smart cities, which actually has been developed quite successfully in, in China. Yeah. To, right? to be fair, la, I mean, I think Salango did quite a good job. Yeah, uh, but because we, but we should do better. We can do better. Yeah, yeah? Uh, because the other day I just had one experience traveling outside, right? Mm -hmm. And to pay for parking, I think uh. it was Kuantan or something. That uh, it's the paper, for right? For the moment that I learned this one thing, right? I forgot how hard it was mm. that you go to every single different district is a different parking. Yes. And then every single district has their own app. Yes. And then every single district has a different way to actually buying that paper yes. and something that app double pakai. Yes, correct. Wow. Then I start to appreciate how important a smart city is today. <laughs> correct, correct. And, and Slango, you take that for granted now because yeah, it's integrated already. Yeah. Yep. So, so I mean, that's just one example. Uh, you know, there are a lot of other things that we can do in the smart city ecosystem uh, that you know, I'll talk about even later in, in one of the uh, further examples. So that's the fourth example. The fifth one, uh, joint research between institutions of higher learning. Mm. Right. So uh, you think about, let's say, uh, you know, the, the, the Boston ecosystem in the US. Uh, they have a few important institutions of higher learning there that actually have uh, very good interconnectivity and research. You're talking about MIT, you're talking about Harvard, you're talking about Boston College, you're talking about, uh, you know, the, the Massachusetts uh, education yeah, system. Leaks, uh. Yeah, some of them, yeah. But, uh, you know, we don't have that kind of joint collaboration in, in, in uh, between Malaysia and Singapore in a real way. So we have UTM in Skudai, uh, one of the, the premier... Uh, technical uh, engineering schools, yep. universities in Malaysia. All the Petronas fellows come from there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as well as uh, from Trono, from their own campus. And then, um, and then uh, you, have, uh, you have NUS, you have NTU, right? So what kind of collaborations can we have uh, you know, that would be win-win? Uh, so uh, it could be from a sort of like an AI perspective because both places, uh, NUS has their AI lab, UTM has their robotics lab. Mm. So why not uh, you know, have this kind of joint cooperation uh, you know, to... Uh, enhance the education ecosystem uh, and also to enhance the R&D and research ecosystem. And I would say also, uh, you know, we talk about agri-tech. You know, one of the things that many of the universities have in, in Johor is access to land that's unused. Whether it's the University of Pago or uh, UTHM, which is near Batu Pahat, University Tun Hussein on, uh, Malaysia. You no, know, they have access to land which actually they can do joint research projects with, uh, let's say, not just institutions of higher learning in Singapore, but also some of the the uh, companies that have invested into food security. Why not deploy those kinds of investments on land where you can do research with the universities? Yeah, I, I think I think I think in terms of knowledge sharing and higher education learning, higher learning, right? It's it's really one of the places that it's very very beneficial for Johor at this point, if let's say there's going to be a SEZ, right? And if there's more collaboration there, because if you look at Singapore, there's actually a very successful polytechnic program. 
Yes. Right? Yeah. And and these are industry related stuff. People are extremely yes. horrible. And Malaysia can just I mean kinda like put that in, you know, with some sort of a collaboration, then we get to retain a lot more of talent. Yeah. People also get paid much more after that as well. There's, because there's of transfer of uh, knowledge and yeah, uh, And best especially practices. with so much of FDI coming in right now, yes. there's a huge need for talent. Yes. And I think that that is one area that hopefully uh, with uh, that the interview that I see in the KJ with uh, TMJ, <laughs> he said that he want to do something about education. Sure. I, I hope that these are some of the things that can be done. Right? Yeah, and you make an excellent point because many Malaysians don't know actually that the Singapore polytechnic ecosystem is actually very mature. Yeah. Uh, they've invested a lot of funds into it. Uh, and it's not just in terms of, let's say, industry from, uh, let's say, FDI perspective into manufacturing. There's a lot of uh, services in the creative sector as well. Uh, you know, fashion design, uh, you know, um, um, this, uh, you know, computer-aided design and, and things of the nature, animation, right, games design, you know, that can easily be part of, part of the ecosystem that can grow uh, within uh, Johor as well as Singapore. So that, since you mentioned FDI, the sixth point I'd like to make is that Malaysia and Singapore can actually make joint investment pitches to to uh, to uh, you know secure more interesting investments from uh, you know leading companies. So mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. You know I, I talked about Tesla in previous episodes, and I'll bring them up again uh, because it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. You know, uh, are you aware that uh, Tesla has their own sort of like a autonomous driving system? Yes, uh, it's called Level Two ADAS. Uh, it's not it's not that sophisticated compared to maybe Mercedes, for example. Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, they use a slightly uh, they, they use a very different system. Uh, a lot of the self driving cars they use this technology called lidar uh, mm. lasers. Yes. Right. So lasers basically you can measure the distance between the the next car and the vehicles around you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's very accurate uh, and it's very fast uh, because lasers travel at the speed of yes. light. Right. But the downside is that it's very expensive. So what Tesla has done is that they've used a different system where it's based on uh, image recognition. Mm. So this would be your AI, right? You know, the the basic AI model started with basically showing the AI system a lot of uh, pictures of cats. After yep. a while, you are able to identify what a cat is yep. because of all the images that you showed. Yep. Same thing with uh, the, the Tesla system. You need to have a lot of data for the AI to process so that the the, the system can learn, uh, oh, this is uh, different models of different cars. They are coming closer. We need to slow down. Mm-hmm. Oh, this there's, there's a further distance away so we can speed up. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, people, the cars that are swerving, what, what to do, how do you respond to it? That's right. Right. So the, the reason why I think I bring this up is because I think Malaysia and Singapore can make a pitch in terms of attracting Tesla or even other players that use this kind of technology to come and test right-hand cars, right-hand drive cars uh, that are in the autonomous vehicle ecosystem. Hey, actually, uh, in that sense, right, I think it's it's quite a perfect match, you know. Because if you actually think about it, there's a lot of times in every single business that comes to Southeast Asia region, they will usually make Singapore their financial hub because of tax advantage, blah, sure. blah, blah, and so on, and the grant from government, mm. the assistance and stuff like that. Mm. But Malaysia is always the next point that they are looking at. Sure, for manufacturing, of, yeah, uh, manufacturing, services, support. Kind of you know, things, right? yeah. a, a joint pitch makes a lot of sense. Yes. Especially if you kind of like cordon off a particular set area so it's easier to manage. Yes, yes. And then you make all these things into like kind of like one package, right? Uh, yeah. I'm just throwing crazy idea to a certain extent. Like, okay, your HQ can be in Singapore, but then uh, if you have some sort of a... Maybe your R&D, yeah. your, your, your sort of like a warehousing of the yes. cars and stuff like that, you park it in Malaysia? Yes, yeah. then uh, these two governments can sort out their tax incentive systems and whatnot. And also, if you park the cars in Malaysia, you don't have to go and go through the issue, the hassle of the certificate of uh, entitlement That's that right. you have in Singapore. Yeah, so I, I think that there's so much that can be done if let's say both decide to really join. Uh, so is that happening? That's the question. Uh, <laughs> can't really say at this point in time, but oh. I, I'm working on it. I'm working on okay, it. Just, okay. just say that. Okay. Uh, but I also want to throw in a few more ideas with regards to this kind of AV testing ecosystem, right? Uh, both countries have pretty good open data policies. You know, we have data.gov.my, they have data.gov.singapore, uh, and that kind of uh, public transport and also other private uh, transportation uh, data uh, would be available to this larger ecosystem through Grab, Food Panda, and other other players. Uh, need some coordination among the authorities from both sides, and you have a you have a situation whereby 
you know, we are actually quite similar to, let's say, California, where a lot of these testing uh, takes place, where people who buy Tesla are the people who would want to, uh, are more techy in nature. Uh, they would be willing to share a lot of this kind of information mm. to, uh, you know, their driving patterns and all that to, to a Tesla entity. Uh, why not host it in, in Malaysia or Singapore? Yeah. Right, uh, and we have uh, ability to to develop uh, AI talent. Uh, we want to do more of this. Uh, you know, Singapore has, uh, you know, um, probably a higher end and more sophisticated. But Malaysia, we have a, a lot more people, uh, and uh, I think the ability to train up these people in the data science and AI ecosystem is very high. Uh, you know, we also have a good five G and four G connection. That's right. Uh, you know, because of successful rollout of five G in Malaysia under Digital National Berhad, we are ranked top three. In fact, our five G average speeds. Is actually higher than Singapore. Oh, yes. This was uh, uh, published by Ukla. Right. right. So right. Uh, when you talk about AI processing and all that, you actually uh, you know would require this kind of five G ecosystem to uh, enhance this kind of uh, autonomous driving ca- uh, right. capacities as well. That's right. Right. So uh, you know it's all when you put these things down on paper, right? There's actually a very strong value proposition that you can make. Even let's say you want to talk about autonomous testing vehicles, vehicles that's uh, you know. Uh, not in Tesla's uh, range at the moment, but maybe later on they'll develop uh, things like uh, vehicles at the ports, right? They will need, uh, you know, it would be an advantage if let's say you could have a lower reliance on drivers uh, and have autonomous vehicles to do transportation of some of the uh, containers and other mm. things which move a bit more slowly uh, at the ports level. Yeah. Right. So, you know, this is uh, something that I've thought a lot about and the, the sort of like value proposition keeps on uh, being enhanced. Like. And it's not just making a joint pitch for autonomous testing, uh, vehicles testing, you're talking about AI talent development. You're also talking about the potential of, let's say, bringing Tesla's uh, capacity for battery systems. So I'm not sure whether you're aware. Tesla, in addition to their car batteries, they also have this thing called the Mega Pack. Yes. Uh, so they, that's, they, they can actually deploy uh, over 100 megawatts. And that they've done it uh, quite successfully in South Australia through through a vendor, uh, and you know we have a lot of data centers coming to Malaysia. Malaysia need that man, uh, and you we know have t- a grip, power grip problem. Yes, exactly. Anyway. TNB and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. So although the systems are quite expensive at this point in time, uh, I think it's something that we can look at uh, to see how it can be deployed as a reserve power for some of the high end data centers like the one that YTL is doing with That's Nvidia, right. uh, and then when the power uh, when when the cost goes down, then you can deploy more, right? And not only that. When you talk about the, the 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 this kind of battery ecosystem, right? It's not just bringing in the batteries. Why not bring in the manufacturing uh, ecosystem as well to produce those batteries? Yeah, I think right? I think battery manufacturing in Malaysia is getting more and more attractive. Yes. Yeah, I've read quite lithium a bit ion, about it. two yeah. wheelers, four wheelers. You know, the EV ecosystem that's growing. Yeah. So this can uh, you know fit in quite easily, and and also maybe the last one is a bit more speculative, lah. Uh, so when you talk about your EV vehicles, right? An important component is actually their chips. Mm. Because uh, Tesla has de- designed their own chips for the visual processing of the visual images. Uh, who Do you know who produces most of these chips? No. It is the jewel in the crown in terms of chip manufacturing in the TSMC. world. TSMC. Yes. Yeah. I don't think TSMC would set up a, f- uh, a foundry in Malaysia. Even though I think you know we have been trying. Uh, the reason is because the, the amounts of investment is very high. You're talking about over 10 billion US dollars. Uh, they are supposed to. They are. They are building one foundry in in um, in Arizona now. Yep. Uh, because of the Chips Act, they were supposed to build a second one. But this is quite widely reported. The first chip, uh, the first foundry, they have had a lot of problems in terms of labor regulations and stuff like yes. that. Uh, so I don't think they would likely build a second foundry in the US. Yes. Which means Southeast Asia is in play. Why would they choose Singapore over Malaysia? I'm I'm being frank here. You know, I'm not saying that that we shouldn't make a pitch for it, but. Because of two factors, they would choose, likely choose Singapore over Malaysia. One is, Singapore has a free trade agreement with the US. And this means that uh, Singapore or companies in Singapore would be able to access some of the incentives under the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm. Uh, secondly, which country is TSMC from? Taiwan. Singapore and Taiwan, they have a, they have a investment uh, protection agreement. Uh, and the reason I know this is because, uh, you know, I recently came back from Taiwan and on the last day I was there, I actually had dinner with uh, people from the office for trade negotiation that sits under the president's office in right. Taiwan. So this was some of the things that I did research on. What is a, what is the investment protection? Uh, it's, it's basically uh, like a, some sort of a G2G agreement whereby you make sure that uh, investments from, uh, you know, 
Singapore going to Taiwan and Taiwan into Singapore, they are given certain safeguards. Lah. And uh, for TSMC, it's actually something that's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, we can actually make a pitch in terms of uh, making sure that the ecosystem that supports TSMC can be located in Malaysia. We can have a very strong supply chain that supports Supply chain, them, the testing, the the, the which OSAT we already stuff kind that we are of good doing at, quite a bit of it you know? anyway. Yeah, so then this becomes part and parcel of a larger pitch. Remember the joint pitch thing? Yep. This is just one example. If let's say you have that ecosystem that has been developed, it may it may be attractive not just to Tesla, BYD, Huawei, other players that are operating in the AV ecosystem, EV and AV ecosystem yeah. can come into this ecosystem. Have, having said that, right, to a certain extent, this doesn't need too big an effort from government to actually, push. Actually, it does. Right? It does. It does because... For AV testing, let's say the AV testing part, right? Autonomous vehicle testing part, you need the authorities, uh, the LTA in, in Singapore and also JPG in Malaysia to come up with the regulations and the guidelines. Right. Because when you talk about uh, AV testing, right? Uh, even though there may be people in the car to monitor and whatnot, uh, there's also always safety issues. Right. Like. But if yeah. let's say we don't talk about like like testing and sandbox, uh, if you just talk about like, for example, the, the manufacturing TSMC part, yeah. manufacturing part, which yeah, that Malaysia, can be done. That can Malaysia be done really relatively easily. So actually, yeah. to a certain extent, government, all MITI, probably or MIDA, right, which yeah. you're, you're part of, yeah. all, all it needs to do is just do an introductory session uh, and some brainstorm it, session. It's a bit know, more whatnot, than that. Right? It's a bit more than that because, you know, when TSMC undertakes this kind of discussion, it's very, very PNC. Right. right. So, so, you know, to get to a stage whereby there can be a joint pitch, there needs to be a lot of trust uh, between a company like TSMC and Singapore and also with the whoever that's involved yes and also if let's say Malaysia wants to be in that ecosystem right, right. that's right. interesting so, so I mean just maybe something a little bit more speculative uh, I'm not sure whether you would have thought of this lah, but uh, you know going back to the visual inspection part lah, do you, have you heard of this company called Karching.co in Malaysia very familiar their value proposition is that they are selling advertisement space on yes. cars. Yeah, I had a coffee the founder the last time. Yes, uh, LSE yeah. alumni, yeah. Jesua. Yeah. So, so um, what they do now is they actually track the traffic uh, and driving patterns of uh, potential and also current uh, people in their ecosystems, like, meaning the, the people who are displaying their ads. Like. So they want to know, okay, by this car drives around here, what are the traffic patterns, how many cars they will be exposed to and that kind of stuff. So that one is not that sophisticated. You can do it us uh, using GPS and whatnot. La. But what happens if, let's say, you make a value proposition to Tesla or other people using the visual mm. camera visual inspection. You say, okay, uh, with certain privacy guidelines there, That's right. uh, let's say, oh, the, the car next door, uh, when they see the ad, what is the response? Does the person turn the head? How, how long does the gaze last on that camera, uh, on, 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 on the advertisement? Is the person a male or a female? What is the age? Right? So, of course, you need to have certain data protection. Yeah. Uh, but if, let's say you can estimate those and, and still blur the face of the person. Uh. I, I, think, I think there's a lot of play that can be done as long as you're creative. Yes, yes, and, correct. And the point is that like, like you can even just talk about sharing data itself. It's already very powerful. Yes. Yeah. So, so, of course. Just I, how to make it meaningful. <coughs> Right? Uh, in the US, there'll be a lot of this kind of personal protection the stuff Malaysia and all that. Lah. Malaysia, Singapore, I think we can f be creative yeah, about it. Yeah, so this can be chill. this yeah. can also be sort of like an R&D angle okay. that can be monetized. Hey, um, um, because uh, there's just two more set things that I want to go into before we end today's yeah. episode, right? So the first thing, before we go into the NVIDIA one, I want to yeah. talk about the SOJ. Yeah. Yeah? There's a lot of things that's being said right now because um, I don't know whether it's timing or whatsoever, but... It is just nice in time when uh, Sultan of Johor is going to be coronated as the Agung and now the hot topic is Johor itself. Sure. Like, so there's a lot of question about like, hey, whether is it because um, uh, uh, our, our future Agung is much more like, hey, I really want development in my mm -hmm. place or is it like just coincidentally the timing? It, it, it's, it's something that the Sultan of Johor has said about himself, you know. He is uh, not only a royal, but he's also a businessman, right? Ah, truly uh, agree. Yeah, yeah, and and you know he he sees business opportunities uh, in in different uh, areas, right? So I, I think this is something that we have to acknowledge and respect. And if let's say those kinds of uh, ideas can be translated into policy actions that can benefit Johor uh, and also by extension Malaysia, you know I I think the government should give it serious consideration. Yeah. Right. So one example would be let's say you know. Um, the forest city development is there already i've been there twice you know you have a lot of unused space there and unused buildings um we should try to do something about it yeah right so if let's say 
you know, the, the ferry landing that I talked about just now, instead of at Putri Harbour, can it be transferred to, uh, to Forest City? Mm. to increase connectivity to Singapore. This requires Singapore government to, 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 to buy in. Uh, but you know, it's something that we should discuss. Uh, Anwar has uh, talked about establishing some sort of a, a financial zone in uh, this uh, forest city. Uh, maybe that can, employ, uh, that can involve some of the sandbox as a service that I talked about, including uh, halal products, for example, halal financial products and whatnot. Right? So you know, we need to try to find some sort of a creative solution to revive uh, Forest City, since it's there, you know, it's an asset that's already been yeah. built, right? Uh, and of course, this related the the next related question would be uh, this uh, high speed rail, right? So, so that Joe has said he wants the high speed rail, uh, and uh, you know, one of the things that he said he is that he hopes that the high speed rail can go through uh, this um, um, Forest City as well, yeah. right? So, I mean, there's questions of alignment and all that. There's more technical side, lah. But I, I just want to sort of like share this idea with you. And since I just came back from Taiwan, right? Have you, have you been to Taiwan before? Yes. So uh, Taiwan has their high-speed rail. Yes. From, uh, from Taipei all the way down to Kaohsiung. Yeah. But Taiwan also has their TRA, their train rail uh, service. Mm. That is a normal train, a slower train that runs actually parallel to the high-speed rail. Parallel? Parallel. So, oh, so okay. parallel meaning like uh, it's sort of like uh, it, 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 there's two lines yeah. there. La. So it's not like Japan like that where it's separate system and all. No, altogether. I mean it's separate systems. Uh, one is much older than the other one. The high-speed rail is obviously newer. But what I'm trying to say is that they have made it work uh, from an economic perspective. right? Those who are willing to pay a higher price, they go by the, by the high-speed rail. And I did that for some of the, uh, you know, lengths, uh, some of the parts of the journey. Mm. If you are okay, you know, traveling at slower speed, you pay less, maybe half the price, twenty five percent of the price. You take the the sort of like a more traditional rail. Mm. Uh, so we may be able to uh, think about that from the perspective of the KTM track uh, that runs from KL to Gamas to Johor Bahru, uh, and also to Singapore as one one uh, way of uh, uh, you know uh, traveling. Uh, and then the high-speed rail as an alternative, yeah. maybe for the business and the corporate side of things. But I have to say that if there's a rail passing through Forest City, it will make a lot of difference. Uh, yeah. and, and I think what I want to say is based on my Taiwan experience is that it's not just a play on Forest City alone. And I think this will be something that I think would be of interest to SOJ as well as the Malaysian government and the state government in Johor as well. What I realized when I traveled uh, in Taiwan is that because of the very, very good public transportation links, uh, rail links in, in particular, it will, it, they allowed a lot of the secondary cities outside Taipei to be developed. So, you know, uh, the second city, largest city last time uh, in Taiwan was Kaohsiung in the south. Mm. Now the second city, the second largest city is actually Taichung. Uh, Taichung, which is uh, just about an hour away by yeah. high-speed rail. It managed to grow because of the, the connectivity. So one of the major problems facing Johor right now is that there's a big north-south divide. Northern side, Sagamat, and to a, from Batu Pahat all the way up to Sagamat, uh, and uh, Moa and areas like that, there's, um, there's a lack of development. Yes. Right? So if let's say you can have the high-speed rail together with the, the KTM, uh, with strategic stops in places like Moa, Batu Pahat, which uh, even, maybe even Pago, then you can start to have the kind of uh, development, physical development in those areas. And also, when we combine this with some of the other things that I talk about with regards to the SEZ, uh, sandbox as a service, uh, linkages in terms of higher education, uh, the, the joint pictures and whatnot, then suddenly you can see the potential of Johor being developed, uh, not just from the Johor Bahru side, uh, Batu Pahat, uh, this, um, this uh, Moa, Sagamat and all that. And then you can see population actually start to move towards these places. Mm. And it can be an alternative to Klang Valley. People who find that Klang Valley is too crowded, they can move to Batu Pahat. Uh, Johorians who find that maybe they don't want to uh, spend so much on Johor, Baru, they go to Batu Pahat, they go to Moa, and you know, you can actually promote other things that I didn't have time to talk about. Things like, for example, uh, sports and also agro agro tourism. Right, people who want to invest in those areas. You go to these places where land is cheaper, so and then the 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 the. the the high-speed rail and also KTM can be part and parcel of the ecosystem. So my, my question is here, right? Because there's also this argument that this high-speed rail uh, is actually not economically sustainable because the air ticket to actually go over yep. is actually way cheaper than the high-speed rail itself. Yes. So at what cost? So we all know that having that rail could actually help a lot So more Taiwan actually faced this problem as well. Uh, initially, the, the, the cost of the, the high-speed rail was something that the federal government or the national government in Taiwan had to, had to bear. Uh, but slowly over time, as the country developed, as they became richer, uh, the, 
the the ecosystem became one where it was actually manageable. Uh, right. So, for example, the high-speed rail from uh, Taipei to Kaohsiung, it runs every 20 minutes. Is that fast? Is that regular? Right. If let's say we can imagine an ecosystem whereby uh, we still have uh, flights, uh, and as as the the economic activity in the region grows, we want uh, you know the possibility of Singapore, Klang Valley, Johor Bahru to be part and parcel of a larger economic uh, area. Then suddenly the you you can imagine the high speed rail being more economical. And I will have a big caveat here. There needs to be certain uh, processes. Uh, and also agreements made between the federal government and the state government, whereby the land value uh, increase as a result of the high-speed rail development, uh, you know, around those stations, part of it must go towards the funding of that high-speed rail and the maintenance mm. of the high-speed rail. Because right now, what happens usually is that the government will build and then all the GLCs, the private sector people, they will go and buy up the land and then they will benefit from it. Yeah. The government doesn't see, see, see uh, appreciation uh, you know, in terms of uh, ah. value increase. Right? So that value increase in that land, part of it has got to go to the federal right, government and the state right. government as well. So it's like, so, I already know that the development is going to be there. I buy the land first and then... Yes, hmm. correct. So, okay, so okay, the okay. JV and you know, whatever, whatever commercial proceeds that come, part of it must be ring fence. And even if, let's say, you sell it to the private sector, the private sector has to pay some sort of a development charge that's linked to the value appreciation of that land. Oh, that, that's smart, that's smart. Yeah, because that's happening right now, right? So what happens is that certain... I'm willing to, to even lose money on this particular project because I know I own all the land around it. Yeah, and it, yeah. it, it cannot or only... Lesser, it, not lose, right? it cannot only be a land or property play. What, what, I'm, what I emphasize here is that it can only work from a long-term financial perspective if, let's say, the other parts of the ecosystem that I talked about just now, the, the kind of uh, connectivity between the two places, the economic activity from joint investments, the pictures and all that, suddenly you see not just Johor Bahru and Singapore, the whole of Johor becomes, uh, mm. becomes uh, you know, uh, comes into play. And that's where you can see like, it's not just Shenzhen and Hong Kong, but suddenly it becomes becomes the Greater Bay Area. I think I think another another point to actually look at is the fact that there's memang a lot of uh, a lot of traveling between uh, uh, KL and and Singapore. Singapore. Yeah, literally, it's one hour flight yeah. That's what we are getting right now And we are not actually even taking into account that people who are traveling from KL to Malacca regularly, mm. or take KL to Seremban regularly, yeah, or, right? or Johor to Malacca, yeah, doing Johor to Malacca, or, things, yeah. right? Yeah. So if let's say you have the whole rail there, yeah, there's gonna be Assuming if everyone transfer over, you have some added people who are going to take on the, the, the journey as well. That's one thing. But on the other hand, also the argument that you're putting out there is also the fact that like, I mean, it's kind of like the highway argument. Lah. Before you have that many people using a highway, you build the highway first and eventually... But the difference is, the highway is purely a physical play. What I'm saying is that there's the software side of things as well. The policies, the yep, people, the right. smart cities and all that kind of stuff that makes this kind of ecosystem a really comprehensive one because a lot of these kinds of policy stuff, right, we would not have been able to imagine 20, 30 years ago. Okay. Uh, so, for example, joint testing of uh, autonomous vehicles, for example, yeah. AI development of uh, capacity development for AI, uh, these kind of data centers that are mushrooming all over the place. So, all this becomes part and parcel of the larger ecosystem. Now, uh, let, let's go back a little bit to the, the SOJ side and TMJ okay. side and, uh, yeah. and current government, right? So what do you think are some of the challenges that the Madani government is going to face? Because TMJ already said that when SOJ takes over, he's going to have a hard time. And Sudan Johor also recently came out and made a statement, right? He said that I want MSCC and uh, Petronas to be reporting directly under me. And this, he's not even coronated the Agung yeah. yet. And further on, they could be much more uh, wishes sure. that's on his wish list to be much more active sure. in governance, right? Yeah. What do you think are some of the challenges that the Madani government will face? I would I won't say it as a challenge. I would say that it is an opportunity. Because you know, Sultan of Johor has said he's a businessman. What the, what do businessmen do? They listen to pitches, they listen to deals, they make uh, you know, um, you know, offers, counter offers. You have to have that's that true. discussion. So I think the the, the opportunity there. Uh, is for the Madani government to have this kind of open lines of communication with the larger ecosystem. And not just with the Sultan of Johor, but with the Singapore government, with the state government in Johor as well, to see what value propositions that you can put on the table. 
right? So some of the examples I, I gave just now is just the tip of the iceberg. When you get more people into the ecosystem, they will have also have their own ideas. Mm. So you could have some sort of a coordination unit, especially on the Malaysian side, uh, that involves uh, the federal government, the state government, and also you must have regular briefings that you have to give to the Sultan of Johor and also to TMJ. Yep. Uh, this already happens. The Prime Minister is supposed to brief the Agong on a weekly basis on some of the things that are happening in cabinet and things like that. But I think given the fact that the Sultan of Johor is so hands-on kind of person, uh, TMJ is uh, like that as well, I think the level of engagement and communication needs to be uh, much higher and you need to have it at a sort of like a more uh, coordinated uh, and also more structured uh, perspective. Yeah, I heard from the, the interview, he said that he uh, SOJ would would not just listen to your brief and go like, oh, okay, but no, he will have he'll, his own ideas. He will question yeah. and he will question to the detail and sure. he will even show you the calculation of why, where you got it from. <laughs> Which is why you actually need people who are equally hands-on to engage you know, at the right level with with the with uh, with uh, SOJ with TMJ uh, within the larger ecosystem, right? And and so then here's the question, right? Because he already did the cabinet lineup uh, right now, and mm. and um, definitely there's this question that there are certain people that he, the SOJ may not like to be in mm. uh, are still in, sure. and in fact strengthen. Mm. There's that speculation all around right now. It seems like it started off the wrong foot, right? So how is mm. it gonna play out? What are your thoughts about it? Uh, I think. Again, I see this as an opportunity. The cabinet is already set. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, it is what it is. Uh, but there can be other opportunities of uh, engagement uh, that can be uh, had uh, and should be had. I think with uh, between the federal, state, and uh, m most importantly between the federal government and also uh, with uh, SOJ and also with TMJ. Mm. And it needs to be to be formalized like, in some way. Yeah. Right, so how this formalized uh, apparatus, uh, you know, will will turn out? I think is still a work in progress because it's something that's quite new. I mean, Sultan Johor has not been agong before. Yeah. Right, TMJ has not been in a position where he has to assist the the, the agong. Yeah. Right. So I think this is where I think uh, you know, uh, people with ideas, people with suggestions, people with experience, uh, you know, in the federal government uh, and also at the state government level. Uh, would be very important players in having that conversation. Right. If you were to be able to throw some ideas around, right, to make sure that this becomes a much smoother process, and like you say, the opportunity that we see is you're able to pitch. Uh, what would some of those suggestions that you'll be giving? I mean, I, I, you know, if let's say I could have a, some sort of a channel to contribute, uh, you know, in a formal way, uh, where uh, you know, uh, myself and. Uh, other people like Kyrie, you know, who's uh, also part and parcel of the state ecosystem, you know, uh, uh, you know, youth advisor to the Johor, uh, you know, ecosystem, very close to TMJ. You know, I, I'm sure us people with ideas, you know, can bring other stakeholders into the, into the picture, and with the help of the federal and state government, we could have, uh, you know, I think much more interesting pictures and ideas to the to the SOJ and mm. TMJ to see how we can, um, you know, not just uh, you know, pitch those ideas, but to be able to refine them, to align them with the government policies, and then most importantly, to execute it on the ground so that people in Johor uh, can see the benefits, and then also the larger ecosystem in Malaysia and Singapore can also see the benefits. Yeah, I, I, I think I think what you say is very true because um, the nature of uh, Suta of Johor, the way at least is being portrayed out, right, um, does require a special dedicated team to actually yes to, to, to manage kind of like manage yes. right, and not yeah. not people who really have substance. People really understand the thing and then managing the relationship in between while at the same time justifying why things need to be done certain way or what new ideas can yeah. be explored. And, out and, of it, and, right? and, 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 and maybe as a last point, I'll, I'll tell you why I think this needs to be formalized. Like, because if it's not formalized, what will happen would be there'll be these suggestions that will be floated up, you know, maybe in the press, maybe in other channels. And then suddenly Anwar would have to deal with it as the Prime Minister. <laughs> Right, so it will be a it will be a big distraction, I think. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, that I think can be avoided if, let's say, the 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 communication channels can be formalized, uh, in a and, and the policy direction can also be formalized, so that you have this kind of special setup to handle those kinds of uh, requests. And maybe not all requests can be can be actualized, but at least you know you can sort of like try uh, you know an experiment to see what works, what doesn't, and then you know hopefully. More things work than doesn't, and then we can see 
hopefully some of the ideas that I talk about uh, actualize on the ground. Mm. All yeah. right. So um, nothing too hard, too big that can't be solved. Lah. It just depends on the uh, individual resolve or the team's resolve to actually make it happen, lah, I would say, right? And, and also the, the, the kind of communication lines and the agreements that, that uh, you know, PM needs to uh, make uh, you know, with uh, the SOG. Let, let's play a little bit of a f- uh, imagination here. Mm. What could be the worst that can happen? If let's say the communication line is not clear and then uh, there's constant like this so, tension, then what could be the worst that can happen? So I'm, my personality is such that I always like to think uh, what, what is the best case that can happen rather, rather than the worst. So you focus on the positive, you don't get bogged down by negative thoughts. Right, right. So the best that could happen to me is if, if let's say you imagine a situation at the end of four years whereby uh, let's say the high-speed rail mechanics and the economics work, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 bid has been given out, open tender, competitive. Uh, you know the the policy framework is already there. Then suddenly you can see the line is uh, being built already with the agreement of the Singapore government, where they are included in in the discussions. You have these kinds of joint pitches happening. You have a very vibrant uh, sort of like entrepreneurship ecosystem that is not just tech but agriculture, tourism, services, thriving between Singapore and Johor. Yeah, uh, and and you have the federal government, the state government working in unison together with uh, Singapore government as part of the SEZ, and then uh, Sultan of Johor looks at this and says, "Great, I, fantastic! I can't contribute anymore already because you guys are doing such a good job. I just, uh, you know, bask in the glory of the good things that you've uh, done, uh, and uh, you know, I look forward to." presiding over more positive results that yeah. you can give to us. Yeah, because I, I, I think that it's, it's very significant actually because under the state government, right, uh, there's that, uh, Sutao Joho has that, that private corporation, right? That uh, Joho, what was it called again? Uh, there are a couple of entities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So, and a lot of development requires state corporation because land matters yes, and stuff land like that. land matters and uh, yeah. local government so, matters. Yep. The better the communication is, the easier for things to happen. Yes. The more bad the communication is, the delay is just gonna be like ah yeah so ma-fana, yep ma-fana, so it's it's, it's a it's a important task, uh, and I think uh, it's a necessary one uh, for yes. for uh, Anwar to think about. Yes. One more last one, mm. which is the story of Nvidia and YTL and sure. Joho. Yep. Now this has struck me as a particularly interesting story, mm. because it's such a big investment. Such a big news. But what happened was that earlier before that, when we kind of got a little bit of wind about it at the mm. time, for most of the private sector, including many fund managers, mm. they were quite unaware. You know? mm. They were like, ah, yeah, I think it's just going to be another thing like that. Mm. And most of them, when the quantum of the project was being announced, mm. they were all shocked. Yep. They were like, how on earth this was wrapped under... Mm. Under and wraps, lah. Yeah. yeah, under wraps. And then the more it came out, literally everyone just knew on the same day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think it's a significant uh, announcement uh, because it elevates the the sort of like a prominence of data centers, not just uh, as a regular data center, but the fact that you have these uh, NVIDIA super high-end chips yes. that are able to do very high-end logic processing, uh, you know, cloud processing, means that the kind of processes that they will do in that YTL data center would be the state of the art. Yeah. Which it's means... next gen stuff, literally. Yes, which means uh, there can be even more uh, argument that you can uh, develop more and bring in more AI-related investments into that ecosystem, mm. including some of the AV testing stuff that I talked about just now. Right, so uh, that that announcement is significant. Of course, you know, the data flows can come from other parts of the world as well, given, you know, the the speed at which, uh, you know, data flows are, uh, you know, are done around the world. Uh, but, you know, it's not only the investment in terms of the data center physical infrastructure, uh, it is also the development of uh, potentially uh, AI talents into that ecosystem that, that I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, uh, testing, uh, cars, and, and also other higher-end applications that, that, that uh, would require this kind of computing power. And at the same time, going back to the joint pitch, NVIDIA is also not uh, ignoring Singapore. Because it knows that Singapore has put in a lot of resources and mm. Lawrence um, Wong has announced their AI 2.0 policy, whereby, among other things, they want to develop as many as 15,000 AI specialists. Not all of it that will come, uh, you know, will, will be from Singapore. Some of it may be from Malaysia. Uh, but then, again, joint pitch, 
uh, you have the data centers, you have the AI processing capabilities in Malaysia, and then you have uh, funds to develop AI talent in Singapore. Yeah. Why not marry the two? And then That's that right. becomes part and parcel of the larger ecosystem. I, I, I think no matter how I see it right now, right, is that it doesn't make sense not to do it. As simple as that, right? Uh, but, <laughs> it, it, but, it's kind of like, like... But but you need people to be able to facilitate and also ministries to, to be able to, to... Champion, facilitate, smooth through some of the bureaucracy between the two countries. Yeah. And if let's say this can be done, I'm sure Sultan of Johor will be a very happy man. TMJ will be a very happy man uh, at the end of uh, these four years. I, I mean, don't talk about them also. I think even for the Rakyat who are there, yeah. it's going to be a significant opportunity. It'll for be a game changer. There. Yeah, it'll be a game it'll changer. It's going to be the next the next KL, right? In a sense. I would say that. No. No, it's, no, it's why, not why scale. Not? It is bigger than KL. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I was about to say. Yes. It's gonna be bigger. Yes, because you look at the Greater Bay Area, Correct. the economy there is huge. <laughs> that's right? right. You combine Shenzhen together with uh, Hong Kong and then you multiply yes. it by other secondary cities in the ecosystem. That's right, that's right. Yeah, it's yeah. gonna be even bigger than KL. Yeah. That's what I think. And um yeah. I think that we have exciting years ahead of us. Uh, we have some juicy things to look at as well. Sure. Yeah, in the near few months. Yeah. And I look forward to more of these uh, podcast sessions. If let's say you guys want more of this, then yep. please leave uh, leave your comments and then also uh, you know give your thumbs up and like. If you guys like this, uh, do write down there in the comment. Just write OKM in the comment and we'll get uh, Dr. Ong to come back and join us once again. Right? And maybe and we can have uh, other special guests to join us as yeah, well. Maybe we should make this a regular session. Yeah. Up to you guys. So see you guys. Tell us what you think.